There we go. All right. I'm here with Marlon Fick, author of Ten Tenderness and the Wood, a new book out from Guarnica Press. Here's a copy of the book. Um, and we're going to talk today about poetics and this work in particular. Um, so how, how are things going, Marlon? They're going okay, you know, considering, yeah. Cons this right. is the first uh, event in, what, uh, five months? Probably, probably the closest human contact either of us had in about that time as well. And the last time we were together was in San Antonio. Was <laughs> as the, the when, walls were as coming the, down. The, as things were happening, and yeah, we didn't really know that what was going on. No, we were. I remember sitting in the bar at AWP watching uh, the news of Seattle um, having community outbreaks and closing schools down for the first time. Yeah. And God knows, like. <laughs> All right, but to to the present. So one thing that I want to talk about first about the book is that there seems in poetry generally today, a lot of the poems being written by contemporary poets ha have a, a confessional tone in kind of a different way. Like it's about the I, the, um, the, the person is personally experiencing and relating the world in a way that is um, maybe not trying to communicate anything other than their own opinions of the world, right? Like I... I have a blood disease, and so it's very difficult for me to go meet guys at bars because I can only drink two drinks and I have to go home, that kind of thing, right? And poems about that. But this book seems to be doing something different, something more, I guess, traditional in the good sense. Um, so I wonder if you want to talk about how, how the book is both personal and universal in a sense, about how, how it's about, you know, obviously experiences uh, that, that one, you know, has, but it's also about the taking away from those experiences and the linking them together with something higher than that. Well, that's my take, at least. Well, and I'm glad you, um, you sensed the tradition element because a lot of editors and publishers are um, clueless about that. They, on the surface, they think I'm some avant-garde, the avant-garde writer, and that's because they're not reading closely. I mean, if they looked closely, they see I'm using tropes or Figuration that is worked five thousand years ago and still working. So I look past and I, I call from the past in the, in the sense of the high modernists. Right. <laughs> and right, I'm not a confessional poet, but um, I don't see how you can really avoid that uh, putting putting the personal in. So, like my wife's paintings, they are the, the poems are a chronicle. Of the past 25 years, mm -hmm. you know, they, uh, so I, I could read something and understand its biographical nature, but uh, you probably wouldn't be able to right. on that level because it's been filtered through so many different uh, interesting words. Because for me, the, the, the fun part of poetry is is finding uh, beautiful language in which to. Uh, 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 how to say this? Uh, I was just, I just saw a cartoon of uh, Charlie Brown's, and he loved these uh, uh, beautiful, this beautiful music with that had such uh, painful content. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good, sad song. No, it was most interesting. I, I think too that the idea that there is, um, well, Eliot once said that. Only those poets who truly have personality know what it means to want to escape from that personality. Right. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's certainly true. Um, uh, you know, Hillman is my friend Brenda mm -hmm. at, at Berkeley. Um, probably was right when she she said early on, this back in the 1980s, that um, I sound like everyone <laughs> and no one in the sense that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do whatever I think is, is at the time that's going to work. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it does, but you know. Well, I think there is like there's a, a universality to the, the experiences that are conveyed here in the sense that it's not you recollecting what happened in a, a you know New York Times story about the events as they fell out, right? There's a processing and an understanding and a relating of the experiences that inform this book that is going on on a, a linguistic and a metaphysical level, I think, that um, makes it poetic. It makes it more than just your voice, in a sense. Right, because the, you know, but the, the tapestries are, the, the canvas is very big, and, and um, the, um, when you, you 
said you, could, you mentioned that it's metaphysical. That's that's probably accurate. Avila thinks that also, and um, some critics that have put little criticism there is on my work mm -hmm. uh, have have pointed out that this uh, it's like a metaphysical poet. Um, mm. But even the you know that's a weird word because even the metaphysicals really weren't uh, metaphysical. Not in the class or the current sense of the word. Not, no, not in the in the classical sense of the word metaphysical. They were. Uh, they just they, they were uh, experimenting with ideas in poetry. Mm -hmm. They were they were foregrounding with uh, intellectual uh, with the intellect mm -hmm. as much as they were with feeling. Right. <coughs> so the kind of complex metaphors that are involved in uh, are called conceits. These are uh, uh, this is this is old, but it's also Contemporary, uh, right. you know, poets like Sharon Olds is considered to be one of the the best poets at handling the intellectual complex of ideas in a poem. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely, I think there's some of that here here too. Is the the using of um, unfamiliar symbols or unfamiliar um, imagery or metaphor, right, to convey a traditional experience or a universal experience, right? Mm -hmm. The same way, um, like Dunn uses the the compass. Talk about the distance between his lover and himself, which is the compass, and then globe was a new concept at the time. There are contemporary language being used to express um, feelings that are, you know, you can trace back to Homer or to Sappho, right? And so the configuration of those in a way that is relevant to our current lives, I think, is a success of the book in that regard. Are you familiar with the, uh, the way in which in that poem? Uh, "Valediction Forbidding Morning" by John Donne, we call it the compass poem. Okay. Um, has you know embedded in that our physical, uh, very body techniques mm -hmm. that we were talking about the compass swinging around and growing erect right. as it comes around. So he, as I come closer to my wife, I you know my, yeah. become more horny. Mm -hmm. As I, but uh, at the same time he's doing that, there's all these uh, levels of of uh, like the eight planets. At that time we didn't have <laughs> Pluto, and now we. Had had Pluto no more, so but we had eight spheres. And right. That's how many stanzas are. It's an incredibly programmatic, mm -hmm. uh, thoughtful design, both uh, both uh, in mind and body. Right. And I think that's for me where the idea of lyric really lies. The idea, not just uh, the eye singing out their grief or mm -hmm. yapping over the building, yapping from the rooftops, but the the um, the, the, the the harmony between. Finding the content and the form in in mirror in in mirror images. Definitely, I think so. I think that's the success of the poem. Is expressing both in the way that the poem progresses, as well as the content, and the words themselves, right, are both unified in their purpose towards that higher expression. Yeah. Um, and that's something that I find um, rarely, or more rarely, in in other poetry I've recently read from contemporary poets. I think that's the success of the book as well. Um, one issue of the, the book, one could say, and I think the introduction kind of hints at it, is the, the notion of um, the fragmentation of experience. That there are, there are bits and pieces kind of laid out, um, both of different uh, localities, different geographic areas, different moments in time, different vignettes of experience that are then um, encompassed in the form and the structure of the book itself. And I was curious, um, Williams famously thought that like from the fragments of our experience, right, we can look back and see that they, they signified a previous whole. Yeah. And I get the same kind of sense of, I don't know if you want to call it hope or of um, assurance that there is a whole that can be assembled or signified from these fragments. It's not just random bits of garbage blowing in the street. Right. I was wondering if you want to say a little thing about how that either is intentional or just is the... the, the um, the inevitable fallout from well, the, the perspective. I think, we're, we're, you know, we're, uh, um, I was a, a bit uh, something of a vagabond, and um, and so that the the idea of the swallow or mm -hmm. the chasing a swallow uh, is because it disappears, and, and when it disappears, I, I sometime in October, I guess they sort of they're suddenly gone, and then. Um, but so was I. I was always gone um, from here to there. So in, in Africa, the poems are in Africa. Um, oddly, there's nothing from China in the book, but I went there too. And 15 years in Latin America, 
Mexico, Cuba, um, in Europe, France, Spain, um, and all over the United States, and and so you have these these uh, these really long distances um, that are the canvas I'm working on, but it's also the uh, content, and that um, it, that's the um, the search for meaning in in the search for meaning in the fragments, as you say. Uh, is there a, a whole? Um, I suppose not until death, you know, and everything is completed at the end of, uh, yeah, I don't really know how to uh, say whether there's hope or not. Mm -hmm. um, I, I suppose so. There's uh, certainly hope in getting, getting it right on the page. Right, right. And there's hope at least that the, the, that feeling of the semblance is expressed adequately. Right. Which is always, I think, one would hope, the hope of any poet. Yeah, if you if you if you've nailed it, whatever the it is, um, sort of a, a record of uh, experience, but authentically witnessed. Mm -hmm. you know. Which yeah, actually moves me to, to the next question I have, which is the idea of authenticity and experience. And the there seems like there is always from the the speaker of the poems a feeling of attention to the other human beings in the poem, not not as objects or as chess pieces, but as um, People of deep interiority and landscapes. I just wonder if you, yeah, I thou, right, <coughs> right. So the central figure of swallows is uh, the two. Really, there's uh, um, my wife Laura who passed away, and um, our daughter. Um, so yeah, they're the. There's uh, uh, the quest. Mm -hmm. How far do we follow them? We follow them even unto death, uh, as Orpheus might his right. Eurydice. You know, that's certainly a lyric element. I think that's the, the uh, thematically a lyric element in the book. Mm -hmm. But I think too that, that that attention or that that desire to trace the or to follow the beloved finds other vessels and views it um, the, the blind girl outside of the Louvre, for example, or the, the old man who's wandered too far from home. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's a, t a tenderness not to, you know, uh, be too... Well, no, that's right. No, I mean, that, that, uh, in fact, that, that poem is close to me, the, Bar the Swallows of Barcelona, because mm -hmm. it really started with my father saying something about how people don't pay attention to, to people who are older anymore. That's right. so I've always made a point of, of, uh, of spending a lot of time with the elderly mm -hmm. and just listening to them and their 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 woes. I, I still call my mother and father every single day, every single day, six and six thirty. You know. So standing. No, I think that, and there's value. I think that that we lose sight of so much in our contemporary time of, you know, everybody being on TikTok and Hulu and Twitter or whatever, right? And listening to the young voices who have so much to say about so little and the fact that actual experience in the world of people who have lived through you know this this process called life are not listened to as sources of knowledge or more in the knowledge wisdom even right mm -hmm. which is a, a an element i find these poems very high in, in wisdom one can take away if one's listening properly um to the poems so I, I guess on that um would you like to read a poem from it? I think we talked about. Sure. Um, one. The, 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 uh, the presence of other as, uh, as, as, a, as not as object is, is, uh, is important. To, mm -hmm. and, and this one is short, but it's, it's called A Priori to His Will. And it's, it's written for our mutual friend yeah. who passed away. Um, Eleven months ago, yeah. just uh, almost a year ago, um, here in Texas, um, Greg Geis, and so it's written for him. It's some I don't know if the camera can pick up, but there are guitars all over the room. I don't think and quite some of those guitars are uh, our friend belong to our friend Greg. And he gave the he gave me his hearing aids and he gave me his guitars. And so and I just I, I just started that way. He left me his guitars and hearing aids so my fingers could fret over loss and my ears remember his laugh. So I listened 
and strummed in limbo to his thoughts the table talk, Pascal, and Martin Luther going out on a limb, when really he and I were on the thinnest limb of all, bearing the weight of the past, summers of love and summers of no love, and winters when a rose would bloom. And when I listened to my friend, God came in the room, that is, he, his searing fountain, jetsam of image and idea. And I learned, listening through his ears, of transformation, the portal of light inside blindness that drives the swift, benevolent star past time itself. I mean, even, even in that short poem, there's just there's so much going on, right? And, and the idea, too, I think, of that kind of, I mean, I find throughout the book is this, this deus absconditas, right? That, like the God who is left or is always beyond um, our perception. Like there, there's mystical mo moments in the book and, and mystical poems in the book, I would say, but they're not mystic in the sense of, of the ecstatic experience of God, but they're mystic in the sense of the acute awareness of God not being where one would find him or, or the searching for God and finding him only in these ethereal traces instead of these apparitions or the, these concrete experiences that mystics uh, have as the basis for their... Uh, yeah, uh, our inter, both of us had dealings with uh, Greg, who is an incredible presence, a mm -hmm. uh, godlike presence, uh, and had this uh, sense. Probably if, if, if that poem only works for one other person in the world, it would be you, because you have had that same mm -hmm. interaction. Uh, talking theology late at night and, and this feeling that sense of God in the room yeah. with uh, it's amazing uh, I'm looking right now at his journals here on the, the Reddit there in the corner now yeah. all those little journals he kept Yeah, I get the feeling like he actually he got it like whatever it is to get out there in, in, in life yeah, he like he got it, it. He, he certainly did not sure what the it is, but nah. Or he would say, I don't know what the it is, but you know, I think he'd agree. Yeah, but that's something that's just a beautiful thing in, in general. Robert Bly is another important mm -hmm. influence because uh, I had come back from uh, Pakistan pretty uh, messed up, you know, as as not quite, maybe not quite as messed up as you came back from Afghanistan, but right, but uh, but messed up enough and. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, it could weird in my head because I, you know, as soon as I started feeling a little better, I wanted to go back immediately. Right. Which is weird. Which is totally crazy. Well, it's totally normal though. I normal mean, normal and crazy. Yes. And 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 uh, it was uh, by virtue of having met with uh, Robert Bly for a couple of days and uh, long conversations with him that uh, he kind of set me straight on the whole uh, insanity thing with regard to war. You um, you don't try to make sense out of something that doesn't make sense. So uh, he's like, quit trying to make sense out right. of that. Just uh, if it, as he does, he'll go out and bring some a clump of grass back to his table and study it and read write about that. He's not trying to make sense out of um, any hole or connect all of right. the dots in the in the stars, uh, but just out of the moment he has with one. The thing before us. Mm -hmm. I think there's some some value to that, and poetry I think does that well um, in general. But in your book especially, is to attend to the immediate, to attend to something that's within our realm to compass, and and we and we even gesture towards the inevitable, the ineffable with that, right? Like the thing is, images and symbols in the poem is gesture towards that which we kind of understand: death, loss, trying to reclaim the beloved, uh, but. They don't do so in this, you know, ephemeral, mystical way. They do so through concrete experience and images and finding that gap in our knowledge and just letting it, letting it abide. They're not trying to answer it somehow pedantically. Um, I think that's important is the gaps abiding in the poems, right? Yeah, I guess the, the Eliot would use the term uh, con con concrete correlative. Right? Or, or objective correlative. Uh, objective yeah. correlative. So the objective correlative in this case would, would be that uh, finding like uh, something like God mm. in in one's wife, right? right. Was, and Paquita is that's the that and not necessarily her as, but the connection, right? Has that godlike energy? Mm -hmm. but yeah, the, the the relation between that um, complex of feelings or thoughts that equals God in a sense, right? And finding its connection and relation through um, the actual. 
Yeah. I think that's it's good. And in um, well, the second poem, or it's the poem <laughs> The Tenderness in the Wood, actually, I find that the images in the concluding stanza of that to be um, of that sort, sort of, right? You have. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the whole the search for meaning outside of time, mm -hmm. right? Because we are bound up in time. That's what we are. We are. That's our constitution. Right. So if you can, uh, so what, what religion it tries to uh, show us is that there is this, uh, this potential moment aside that it doesn't exist in time at all. Mm -hmm. you know, it's beyond time. So if you can um, match your uh, will to love to that uh, existence of, of love in the pure form, right. then you're getting closer to... I suppose closer to God and so or closer to timelessness, which is, I guess is the same thing, all yeah. really, right? Well, yeah, and you know, he, human experience is so uh, physical mm -hmm. that uh, we cannot even tell the difference sometimes between uh, a re religious experience and orgasm. I mean, right. Like, oh, that and maybe that's blasphemous to hear for some people. But, you know, it's true though. It's, it's I ecstasy. Think, I is think like it's, it has this lost sense of loss of time and, and ecstasy, whether wherever, wherever that ecstasy is coming from. Right. Well, definitely. And that's it's the times that I guess we forget about the embodied or the temporal altogether. We lose our space and our time, and we're in, caught up entirely in the experience itself. Right. And that I mean is I mean maybe the beatific vision if you're Catholic or is the, you know. Um, you know, actually yeah. see if you're a, a, a hedonist. I, sus I suspect that puts us on the same page as Ezra Pound in, the, in that uh, he didn't really see any difference uh, between aesthetics and, and theology. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the aesthetics were re in, in replacing religion for him. Right. Or, or not really replacing it, but just occupying that space. Certainly. And the quest, I guess, in the, for beauty in the, the, the pure sense, right, is the same quest for the, the divine beauty. And that, that, that begs a question, though, because if, if we don't achieve that, if we set out to achieve that, and we're, we're obviously we're going to fall short, mm -hmm. um, poetry really is a sort of an apprentice, apprenticeship to failure. Right? Yes, definitely. Because we're never going to make it. And, and it becomes painfully obvious you know, when you're scrolling through Facebook and you see the other poets posting their <laughs> dreadful poetry. Right. Um, you think uh, you know? I don't even go around saying anymore. I'm well, a poet. Right, I don't say that because I would be hate to be mm -hmm. someone look look at and say ah, you know, like one of those. Yes. Oh gosh, that's uh, embarrassing. Well, it is, and I, I think <laughs> there's there's something to that in the element of faith that keeps one writing poetry in spite of these you know wanting yeah. to not be associated with poets. Well, I want to be associated with poets, but you're an exception. Well, you're sure. an exceptional poet with. Your book, uh, uh, Blood Stripes, uh, an amazing book. Thank you. Again, just trying to, to fail as, as gracefully as possible. Well, and I think you do. I think <laughs> it's uh, an incredible um, commingling of, of intense, raw experience and incredible, gorgeous surfaces in, in language that are, are hinting at those, those deep places, those wounds. Mm. Like, yeah, try try to at least. I think, I guess maybe that's one thing that comes out of this book too, is there's a series of, of wounds or gaps that are discussed um, and that are discussed and rather than trying to be resolved or healed quickly or somehow put a band-aid on them, right, they're existing and stretching through time in the book, right? There's like the quest for the beloved, the wound that that is, the loss of the child, it is never resolved. There's never a, okay, well now I have an answer, and now I can just move on with that. Oh, right. No, I don't think we do ever have an answer. Right. I think mean, uh, that's, uh, yeah. yeah. I think the, the book does so well in just abiding in that sense of loss and yet moving forward, I think. And maybe as far as it goes to being human is that, I mean, life, existence is a state of loss of one thing to the other. Um, so why I, I actually I don't mean to be political for people out there, but I, I really had, I'm attracted to uh, this this uh, man Joe Biden because he has the same kinds of experiences um, as 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 I do, but, um, you know, picking up and starting all over again, you know, mm -hmm. losing your family, and then I met Akita, and that became right part two in my life. Right, like dealing with difficulty and like not. Um, not cashing it in. Right. 
I think there's one, I mean, I don't know why I was reminded exactly of, but um, in Brothers Karamazov, um, Ivan's talking to Alyosha, who's the religious novice, and he's mm -hmm. talking about what his beliefs in the world are, that he's seen, seen children suffer, he's seen he, uh, parents who lock their daughter in an outhouse and she froze to death, and a military general plucked this infant from his mother and thrown him in the snow, and he's like, how, how can I believe in God in a world where suffering like that exists? Like, if I were to see God, I, I would cash him, I would give him my card back and say, I refuse to be part of your world, I refuse to be part of this experience, like, you're terrible. And I think that there is opportunities in the poem for, for the, the poet or the speaker to have good reason to cash in their card and to say, I'm out of this. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it refuses to. Good. I, I don't think that I planned it that way. I think that's just, <laughs> I think that's just who I am. Right. You know, like, well, if it came across, that's, I think that's good. Well, I think so. I think it's a beautiful uh, statement to, I mean, your, your persistence as a human being and your persistence as, you know, in the process of failing of poetry, right, is that, I mean, even in the minim minimal suffering that, you know, people have who, who don't experience great loss and tragedy and such r rapid loss and tragedy, right, um, have all kinds of, you know, maladies that arise from not confronting that. And, and just to see that the endurance of the wounds across the pages is, is um, something I think you sensitively handle as well as, um, explore in ways that can be productive for anyone who happens to be human. <laughs> Reminds me of that. There's a line I think in the book that might capture uh, mm. what it is you're talking about. Um, it, it's it's a little poem that uh, has never really had a lot of airtime before, uh, but I like it, so it's here. Oh, um, it's uh, I think it's just a little poem called "Smoke Rising Through the Trees." Uh, smoke floats up from the cook fires and into the mm. trees where we lived, darting from branch to branch as swallows, the pure life reaching and twisting toward the sky, t reflecting its vast and empty nest where we lived, and also where we could dig a fine and spacious grave that would be large enough for such a life. Mm. Uh, that, that's, that's sort of speaking to uh, that theme you pick up on of... Uh, you don't have any, uh, the wound never closes, but you, you continue to, to go. Right, and you're just moving, moving like forward. Beckett says at the end of the trilogy, he says, that, uh, or, uh, I can't go on, I go on. That's right, the right. last sentence. In the, and that's, like, that's the paradox of life too, right, I suppose, right. is that like, we can't, we, we, we endure sufferings, we endure losses that, the 